everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Karen Inglis. Hi Karen. Hi Jo, how are you? I'm good, it's great to have you back on the show four years later, which is amazing. Yeah. And we don't look any different, do we? <laughs> no, in fact, I think we look better. Um, but just a little introduction for those of you who don't know Karen. Karen is the author of books for children, including The Secret Lake and Eek, The Runaway Alien, as well as book apps. Her latest book, which I know many of you will be very excited about, is How to Self-Publish and Market a Children's Book. And Karen, I've been bugging you about this for years so I'm so happy you've got this book out but just start off by telling us a, a bit more about you and your writing journey and also what has changed for you since 2014. Okay um, my writing journey really started uh, when my children were young so, so I was a professional writer I, I've been a copywriter for many years for the financial services industry and um, when I was having my uh, when the children were at home and I was uh, uh, not working full-time that was how I got into children's writing because I was reading to the children and, and se seeing some great stories like Harry McClary but also some not good, such good stories and thinking oh I could have a go at this and and so that's how I actually got into writing writing to begin with uh, and uh, I obviously tried to get my stories published in the beginning and had the usual thing of rejections and they all went back I had one called Ferdinand Fox and the Hedgehog and the Secret Lake and they got turned down and they went back in a wooden box for 10 years and then I got them out again in 2010 when I had a sabbatical from my work I had a whole year off and did a lot of editing and that, that was the time that self-publishing was coming around and uh, create space and so I know I think you were pretty much the only other person I knew in the industry who was English, although you were in Australia <laughs> doing it. Um, and that's, But that's when I actually started looking into it and decided I'm not going to send it out again my, my, this time. I'm going to do it myself. Um, mm. So... And then, and then, so 2014, you had a couple of books out. I think you were doing an app uh, around then. You'd started doing yeah. apps. So what, yeah. what, what, what have you been doing since then? So I have, well, the app... Um, I no longer market the app and that's very, very recent. And I would say to anybody, just in case that's a question in their mind, I would just say, go with caution with apps. They're very, very, I've sold, I actually have sold over 550, which apparently is a very good number to have, but you've got to keep up with the platform changes. And it's not really a priority for me. It costs quite a lot uh, to, to get it done in the first place. Uh, but it was an experiment that I wanted to do. Um, but you also, once you have a book app, you have to pay Apple £79 a year just to have it on the platform, never mind keeping up with any changes that they make. So I live Literally, I sort of reluctantly just this year pulled it and that was only because now it was going to require updating and I just thought well I, I can't justify the cost because I'm not selling enough uh, to justify that mm -hmm. so so rather than go down the app route since well, you and I have both spoken I've come out with uh, I've got more children's books out now I've got six books all together so I've got um, I've got obviously the first Ferdinand Fox story which I had when we spoke probably and the secret lake and eek uh, and now got Henry Haynes and the Great Escape, uh, Walter Brown and the Magician's Hat, uh, and Ferdinand Fox and the Hedgehog, which is another um, picture book in the same series. Um, and those I have out in print uh, and in e-books. I've continued to go into lots of schools. I think I was probably visiting mm. schools when we first came around. And I would just say... You know, to anybody, you really, if you're going to write for children, you need to get out there and meet your readers because most children buy, uh, read in print and most book children's book sales are in print. Um, and unless you're very well known, that's going to be the main way that you start to sell to begin with. Things have changed recently and there's more sort of hope in terms of marketing online. But mm. You need really to have, I would say, uh, where that's been most successful for me is where I've got the book with good reviews, good organic reviews that I've built up over time. And those have come around as a result of my going out and doing school visits. Um, and I've also, and, and by the way, those school visits by the beginning of this year had garnered me something like um, 4,000 copies in print of The Secret Lake sold. I'd then already sold another two or 3,000 online between print and ebook. So I was already at 7,000 sales of those, and probably up to about 12,000 sales all round by the beginning of this year. And that's now 
jumped up again with uh, more online sales mm. recently, which we'll no doubt come on to talk about. We will. No, yeah. that's that's fascinating. And you've touched on a number of things that we're going to get more in depth in, in this interview. So people listening yeah. going, oh, but I want to know more about that. We're going to come back to it. But first of all, yes. I want to start with... The question of age, because people go, oh, I'm writing a book for children. I mean, even you, these books you've just mentioned, age bracket is huge. I mean, we all know the difference between a little wooden block book for, a, you know, a two year old or whatever, a one year old. And then, you know, what it, I guess ch child goes all the way up to. 16 I, I guess so, so well, te technically I'd say if you say you're writing for children you're writing up to age 12 but one of the biggest mistakes you could potentially make is to not know what target what age group you're writing for and I would say and I, I talk about this in my book it's that what you there are three sort of key age groups I suppose there's sort of naught to five uh, which is in your sort of picture book uh, and there you've got sort of between naught and a thousand words with an, an average an ideal of 500 or, or fewer words uh, you've then got uh, a chapter books which are really for early readers and so those will be aimed at age Age five to seven and they those will have a, a, a different word count typically between a thousand words and six thousand words and then you've got what, what what is now being adopted as this term middle grade novel which is for ages eight to twelve and that can be sort of between 20 and forty thousand words and typically mostly doesn't require any illustration but you can you know can you might find some Chris riddle puts uh, illustrations in his goth girl books and things like that so so those are the sort of three broad categories and I you know and anyone says to me oh I'm, I've got I'm going to I'm writing a book for children my first question will be well, what age group is it aimed at because so many things flow out of that which is not just the book length but it's going to be the, the level of language that you use the sort of themes you might be covering uh, and also the actual format of the book will it need illustrations will it not how big will the font size be will it be ragged right or will it be justified uh, what will the line spacing be i mean there's some very quite you know there's some quite subtle differences which make all the difference between getting it right and getting it wrong i suppose when you're writing for children and so it's knowing your target market and that's broadly how it falls um yeah, I think it's so interesting um, because I would think that middle grade um, fits into many of the other discussions I have. It's text based. It looks like, I mean, obviously the writing style is different, but and in terms of self-publishing, you can self-publish it in that way. But uh, the children's book in print. So when we're talking about um, heavy illustration, which is expensive, or we're talking about pr uh, premium paper, or we're talking about, you know, hardback distribution in bookstores, it seems to me that children's book publishing publishing is expensive and difficult. So can you talk about the print publishing side of kids books? And people think, oh, I'm going to do a kids book, it'll be in hardback, it'll look gorgeous, and it'll go in a bookstore. So is that right? Um, you know, what, what, what are the what are the issues there? Well, I would say that um, getting into a bookstore I wouldn't think that would be your, should be your priority other than getting into your local bookshop because unless you've got a national marketing team behind you, it's the same as actually any other self-published author. It doesn't matter which age group you're writing for, adult, young adult. Unless people know you, they're not going to be walking into stores around the UK saying, you know, they want to buy your book. Uh, therefore, that that shouldn't be your your focus. Your focus with those hard with your, I would say hardback, I'd say paperback books, uh, is to get them potentially into your local bookshops, ideally into your local bookshops, but also into the hands of your readers that you're going to meet at going out to live events and typically school events. Now, what can happen over time if that works well and you do it properly and you follow all the rules that you and I know that we all should follow, which is using editors, doing it professionally, you can start to build your, your author brand and get, get known. And the more you get known, the more other bookshops might actually welcome you because they can they've if they've had parents coming in locally. So so for example, and I think this might have already been underway when we spoke last time, I have during my early years, I've been in six or seven branches of Waterstones doing book signings there and selling a lot of books with them. And that was on the back of the fact I built up my brand locally through schools. Um, and then one Waterstones heard about me through another one. But that was, the, you know, I live in London and there are lots of bookshops quite within quite a close range of each other. But I don't think that's typical. So I think with your print, 
it, you, you would typically you will do you'll start doing print on demand using you know either create space at, at the combination ideally of create space and ingram spark i'd say get your school stock or your your short run stock from ingram spark or sorry kdp print we now know everyone's getting moved over there and i don't know i'm assuming just do the sums to see whether kdp print is cheaper to get your books for home stock or, or, or um whether ingram spark is so so you would get maybe a small stock to start with use that for your local events to begin with what can then happen is you know and again i sort of cover this in more detail in 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 the book is if you get if you're finding you're building your brand up and is selling a lot which i have so i was typically ordering 200 copies of the secret lake at a time from ingram spark um you can, there are other ways that you can maybe get a slightly cheaper run. That might be the point at which you go to um, a short run digital printers, uh, and and perhaps you'll find that the per per cost per item cost is lower that way. Now, actually, I've only recently turned to doing that because uh, because of the success the Secret Lake has recently had online, and I wanted to make sure that if bookshops wider than round the corner started ordering it that it was showing in stock so i've gone through another route uh, using clays for that uh, but that's only very very recently it's it's the kind of thing i'd say you know do it gradually um even though you might be able to get a, a big order at a cheaper price through a second uh, supplier how many plates do you want to be spinning in those early days in terms of you know because you're going to have to come up with a separate load of files for that third printer sort of do it gradually is what i'd say and i think you know we people probably all find it. it's one of those things organically growing is the best way <laughs> yeah and but i just want to come back on the illustration um because yeah. you mentioned there like that what you described there was kind of straight print on demand publishing but what, yeah. are, what are the issues with children's books that have full color illustration um, in terms of print you yeah mean. which uh, a lot of you know the young those younger zero to five i would have thought a lot more yes. people would want that so want those. okay mm. right so so uh, something i came across early on was i didn't realize until the last minute that print on demand doesn't do the silk finish paper which is a slightly thicker paper that you you know a lot of those uh, picture books have and so i therefore did go out and source um an upfront uh print run through um a company and it was a quite scary because I started off ordering 100 and, you know, it wasn't that economic. And in the end, I ended up ordering 500 and I'd sold, sold 500 that way. Now, interestingly, because most of my picture book sales, and this will apply to most self-published children's authors, they're going to happen. They're going to either happen at school events or they will come off uh, Amazon or somewhere. And actually, the parents... The parents don't mind about the paper because actually I say in my and I've said it on my blog that's live now and I say it again in the book, the, the quality of the paper that you do get from print on demand for colour is actually very nice. And, and when I decided to go and get an advanced print run and, and pay a bit more to have silk finish, several people I showed the book to said, well, why are you bothering to do that? It's fine. And actually, the reason I was doing it was because I wanted it to sit comfortably alongside other books in the bookshop shops but then if you think about what i've just been saying about bookshops that's really a few copies in your local bookshop um parents really don't mind i mean as long as you've done a good quality book um and the quality of the paper is good so i would say actually whereas once upon a time i said that i thought that was a problem i've in the last few years you know updating my blog to say actually on balance, I would, you know, I don't think you need to do it unless you're absolutely hell bent on getting into lots of bookshops. Mm. Uh, no, that's yeah. really that's good advice, and it's kind of um, it's that ego thing, isn't it? It's basically saying, well, I'm expecting this to sit next to this book in a bookstore, whereas that's not, you know, that might happen, but that's a tiny part of what the sales will be. So just um, again, sort of coming back on the cost for the illustrations. Um, again, some people might not realise that you have to pay an illustrator up front for these picture books so yeah. um how have you managed that um you know and how i guess what are your recommendations for finding an illustrator and um you know maybe some idea of of the upfront costs when you're doing a picture book 
Well, there are lots of online um, places you can go and look for illustrators, and there's a huge, huge um, variety of costs that you can you can go for. So you've got all the the, the websites like Fiverr.com. I think 99 Designs. I hear people have used. I found my illustrator who's in Bosnia and has been uh, we've worked together ever since through what was then called Elance, which is now Upworks. Mm. So so I mean, my advice would be, and, and also there are some UK-based um, organizations organizations and they're listed like off the top of my head I'm trying to remember the names of some of them childrensillustrators.com I think there's another one called behance.net I think over in the states mm. um, so you can go on there and it is a bit like you go you go and have a look at uh, the style and then you you see what they're charging and you, you you go from there so to speak but most of the time or all of the time in my case you'll you'll end up paying for the illustrations and then owning the copyright at the end. It's not a sort of royalty share situation because if you think about it, that's a huge risk for an illustrator. Um, but the budget, you know, I think some illustrators will do, you know, an image for $10 or others might be $25. It's one of those things actually because of this global world we live in that you can you there is a, there's something for all budgets but you've obviously got to find something that suit you know that fits with with what the design that you want for your book and that in turn is a matter of doing all your research at the start to see what other books similar to yours what, what sort of style either are they what what's selling uh, and, and so on and so forth does that mm. answer the question yeah, yeah it's great actually and you talk there about relationship um you know you and i've known each other a, a long time now and and yes. I, it's the same with me with the cover designers, with editors, you, it takes a while to find people. But when you do find people, you you know you carry on working with them. So I think yes. that's the thing. If people listening are just starting out, it may seem difficult at the beginning. But there's these hurdles, and once you're over the hurdles, like your process flow for your books and everything is is settled as is mine. Yes. But it yes. can. It, I think it can seem insurmountable. But that's that's the print side. Um, let's just talk about ebooks because many people say oh don't bother about ebooks for kids um so what are the the different types of uh, digital aspects i guess um well i would definitely say um uh whereas a few years ago when we first spoke i might have said look ebooks yes by all means do them but they're definitely not a priority whereas today i would say yes definitely do an ebook because it's another way that you can use to market your print book if you see what i mean um and so as we probably all know online advertising has sort of burst burst onto the um burst onto the scenes recently through ams ads and certainly in the early days, in, uh, over in the States, when AMS ads came along, you could only advertise ebooks, and I and I actually happened to have them, so they were already there, and that was great. But what I found was that people, uh, you know, parents uh, were finding obviously clicking on the ad for the ebook and then buying in print. Uh, so so you know it was a it was a sort of tool, it was a means to an end. But you know I had not huge sales of, of, of ebooks, although again that's creeping up. And I would say for middle grade novels, eight to twelve you're probably going to find you're selling you know once you're discovered you will be selling in a reasonable number particularly i've noticed with the secret lake now it's creeping up from very few to to you know a reasonable number each day now that might just be the summer holidays are coming and people are about to go on holiday and for that age group uh, particularly that seems to be um you know it's picked up a bit um in terms of the tools, I mean, what's amazing now, as you know, since we probably last spoke, I mean, I remember back in the day when I did The Secret Lake trying to work out how to make an, a, a Moby file. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was there for days reading all those instructions on the KDP. Oh, God. And then Vellum came along and changed my life. <laughs> We love Vellum on this podcast. Oh, God, I absolutely love Vellum to bits. They Brad and Brad, Brad just madly love them. They know I've been telling them for years I'm going to write this book and they're going to have this great big chunk inside it and they're so pleased. Um, so if you have a Mac, you know that really has revolutionised. And even even to the point of Eek the Runaway Alien, Walter Brown and the Magician's Hat, which have black and white illustrations inside them, they were really easy to do on Vellum. Very easy to do. And so okay, again. But that even though most buy in print, I did the only book I've ever given away. I've never given away the Secret Lake. I did give away. Uh, I had a short Insta freebie with 
week just to see, you know, whether I could get more interest over in the States in the print side. Um, so they are good for sort of giveaway type situations. And as we probably know, Book Funnel has now um, come out with these print codes. Uh, so I was thinking, well, there's another good you know if you've got a book that you're trying to promote perhaps you could have some little labels you could give away at schools to say look you can get the ebook for free or give it to parents and they can test it and have a look at uh, and then buy the print book ultimately for their child that that sort of thing mm. um, or the other thing with the ebooks i mean i uh, i'm happily child free as you know but i have nieces and nephews and i'm i shop for them online and yeah. you know you can only see certain pages when you you know when you look in inside but you you know yeah. but if you download a sample a digital sample you can actually see more so i think e like you're saying that ebook can can be bought because it, it, they want to buy the ebook or it could be a sample for the print book yes so, yeah so i think we're basically saying yes do ebooks in for any of the, these age groups yes and it's a means to an end really it's a, and you will you know the bonus is that that um you will get you know that you might get some sales of people generally you know, that, that there is a number of children who do like to read on kindle and so they will get them the other thing i have done that's quite interesting um is i took because of course i don't write in a series because i'm silly uh, i've just done all these <laughs> i've just done all these standalone books which you know they just came to me but by accident rather than de than uh, design they go across all the different age groups which at least means when i go into schools i can often go and see the whole school so to that extent it works mm. but what i have done is with three of them so with the secret lake eek the runaway alien and walter brown and the magician's hat because those are roughly the same age group sort of seven eight to eleven i have taken the first three chapters of each of those because because vellum is so easy to use and created uh, a you know what i want to call a box set mm. sample sampler. and i've made mm. and a sampler and i've made it free uh, on uh, I, I set it free that's the only place where i'm wide at the moment and made it free and of course amazon has price matched and I just thought, well, actually, that's, again, another way of using a, uh, it as a marketing tool, because then that's got links to, obviously, the fact that the print books are available, the full versions of them. So that was the sort of closest I've come to mimicking what people who write for adults have been doing with their, you know, first in a series, if you see what I mean. Just on that, just using, again, just, you know, so e-books are good for sort of... Um, uh, taste to marketing I, I suppose is what I would say yeah no that's yeah. fantastic okay well let, let's stay on marketing because one of the things that again people say is oh it's so hard to market children's books because you can't market to your audience it's like it's unethical to advertise to ch directly to children and half the time yeah. you can't reach them directly um so there's there's the, obviously the two sides of marketing the digital marketing and then the in-person marketing so let's start with the digital you've mentioned a couple of things um yeah. but but what's the reality of digital marketing for children's books are you just targeting adults or how are you doing that oh, oh well it's well I'm just the, the most successful, I would say, is AMS. And so obviously I'm, obviously I'm targeting adults just by targeting books that are similar to my books on, on Amazon. I would say, you know, there's the whole thing of Facebook. And I've tried Facebook over the years. I tried it back in the very early days, 2011, 12, um, or whenever it was first allowed. Um, and I've tried it more recently as well, you know, when it's become where you can... I've never found... I haven't found a way to make money from it. I've just found a way that Facebook takes my money. Um, <laughs> but you have but you found know, you AMS. Know. Yes, AMS exactly. works for you. Yes, yeah, so, and so what I what I say is you have to try these things to find out. And, I, and the thing is you can, with Facebook advertising, target people with children aged 8 to 12 uh, and who like Enid Blyton and this and that and think, oh, gosh, this is going to work. But it, it hasn't worked for me. Um, and I don't know many children's authors to, or any who, I, who have said it has worked for them other than that big book called uh, Lost My Name, mm -hmm. uh, the wonderfully mm -hmm. one. But even they at London Book Fair this year were talking about how the cost per acquisition of customer was very, very big on Facebook. Uh, you know, I got the impression they were, you know, they've got million pound budgets and things. And I think the reason that 
particular book worked was because uh, it's a personalized book so it was quite an un unusual product now that's not to say I won't go back because I think you know perhaps and, and I did try when I had the app targeting grandparents because we know that grandparents have more time and so that is something I will perhaps go back and look at but you know being a children's author as anyone will tell you you're so busy physically getting the books out and then spending time getting events organized and then going to the events uh, you know there's only so many hours in the day as it were so but but yes if you ams ads i would say out of all of them and best done when you've already established yourself and got you know some some decent reviews on on the books but mm. as equally as you know as you know um you can control the budget anyway you can just turn it off so you know um, yeah so and just for people who don't know so amazon marketing services and you can basically pick a book so let, like the gruffalo and you can say i want my book to appear um underneath the gruffalo um so that basically you choose the books you're targeting and you mentioned that um i can't remember which book but that you're seeing a lot more success recently so is that yes, is yes. that purely because of ams you think I think so. I mean, what basically what's happened with The Secret Lake is it's always been my bestseller. Uh, and so, and it's a tr traditional story, which I didn't think there were enough of around. Uh, and when I go to school events, it just, it always sells probably almost double any of the other book. And I get teachers mentioning it to me. It was considered, it was also read by the head of independent commis uh, commissioning at CBBC uh, many years ago. I think many years, about three years ago, four years ago, I met her at a, at a, at a, an event and mentioned it to her. And she said, oh, send it to me. And I thought, oh, I won't hear anything. And she emailed me within a few weeks to say, this really, I really enjoyed it. And it actually very much would lend itself to something like uh, BBC TV. And she said, because I'm head of independent commissioning i'm not the person to go to because i'm i'm the independent but she said you can either go direct to bbc or you can go via an independent commissioning route uh firm mm. uh, and 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 so i did go direct to bbc and it took a while and in the end they didn't go with it because they've got so many things and there is that other but they said you know she said go the other route as well and i just haven't had time to do that but sort of coming back to your question i think it is a very special story and it's just never been able to be seen on Amazon. People can't find it. I, I, I think what it's done is because I'd already sold about 7,000 copies by the time I started doing AMS ads, it had proven itself that it is a good story. It was just that it's a good story if you know it's there. And what AMS does, and I think this applies for everyone, and we all know it, is it puts us on a level playing field with other publishers because we can put our books on that front table in the same way that they can when you go into a shop. And so so then it's down to, okay, how good's the cover? How good's the blurb? How good's the story? And are you targeting the right people? And that's what it, that's what it is at the end of the day. Um, and very quickly, after AMS opened in the UK uh, to me and I've been trying to get into it for ages but it kept asking me for a VAT number and I had deregistered for VAT about three months before and it was when they finally realised that you didn't you know they, they stopped you having to be registered for VAT that I got on and very quickly I saw the, the numbers starting to creep up you know mm. it's noticeable actually um, yeah mm. and um, you mentioned the front table in the bookstore there very importantly if people don't know you pay for the front you know table in a bookstore and you pay for amazon ads so it's definitely a uh like you've done a testing and you know worked out what works and what books to put it on so um and we've had podcasts about um amazon ads before so we won't go into that anymore yeah. so let, let's yeah. talk about um in-person marketing so the schools like to me that just sounds like so much work for very little uh, return so, so what do you yeah. think about the the school's side of things yes yeah. no i think it's great i think it's great you say you have very little return you actually make a much bigger return when you're selling your books at schools because there's no middleman okay so you know my book at 6.99 the secret lake uh, maybe it's cost me two pounds to to create it so when i sell it if i sell it at full price i'm getting a four pound profit which is a lot more than i will get uh, when i'm 
I'm selling online. Uh, so that so that's the first thing. The second thing is that you know you can sell a lot, and you know if you do it properly and it takes time, you've got to build it up, and you've got to do a really good, you know, you've got to give them a, a good run for you know a good performance, as it were. Mm. Um, but you can sell a lot of books, and also you charge for your time. I mean, only in the very first few visits that you do do you do it for nothing. And I, I you know talk about when you're building your confidence locally, you can offer to do a visit you know, here and there to build your confidence. But now if I go to a school, I will be charging uh, a de- either a day or a half day. And I, that will vary according to the school. If I know it's a state school with a small budget, I'll adjust it. Uh, you know, it just depends on how far you're going. So, so you are getting paid for your time as well as selling the books. And even you know how many books you sell sometimes depends on how organized the school is you know you can you can sell 100 in a day or you might only sell 35 but at the end of the day that's 35 more children uh, who've seen your book and the word of mouth is is really how you know people start to know you and but it, it is a long you know it is a slow and gradual process there's no sort of race to market with it um and but i don't think i think most children's authors will be writing because that's what they want to do and they're very keen for to see children enjoy a story and to encourage reading so it's not a chore Uh, the hardest part is probably ringing around and contacting the schools and and getting the bookings but now i'm at the stage where people contact me i've already been contacted uh, a few weeks ago by a school in herefordshire saying oh we love ferdinand fox would you come to our school in the deeps of hereford i said well i'd love to come but you know we need to find another school and i have to come for the whole day and by the way and because i've got this all set up now i just said here's my books overview here's my school visit format i could do the whole school now if we can find another school nearby now that's already now been sorted out so i've got two days in hereford a friend of mine happens to live just outside hereford so i'm staying with him uh because i said look you know i actually have to have a friend there so um but they you know they come to me now rather it's not all me having to um to find you know, yeah. Wow, I had no idea you, you would get paid for that. I, I doubt if it's thousands and thousands of Oh, no, it'll be between. Dollars. I mean, the Society the society of um, Authors, I think, when I last looked up their page, although it, I don't know if it was out of date, it was sort of say, it was said that a typical author's day rate should be between 400 and 1,000, depending mm-hmm. on, you know, whether you're David Williams or a mid-list unknown author. Well, I know anecdotally, uh, anecdotally, uh, whatever, anecdotally, <laughs> That, uh, you know, people will charge between 300, 450 a day, that sort of thing. And that's the kind of thing I'm charging just because I feel that's I'm very conscious of school budgets at the moment. Mm. Um, If I was asked to go a long, long way to a very wealthy school, then I'd probably charge more. Oh, and talking of going a long way, I just have to tell you this. I got contact. I was contacted earlier this year and and asked if I would consider going over to Sao Paulo to do Marvellous. Is paid flights the whole thing to for World Book Day week, and it was down to between me and someone. And I said, We'd love to, uh, but in fact, it didn't come off. They, 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 there was between me and one other author who turned out to be she was traditionally published, her husband was, was the illustrator, and the books went in with the curriculum. So it was, it was fine, but it was very flattering. Um, that's and fantastic, fact, it was amazing. Um, although I did then think, Actually, it's World Book Day week when I'm always completely booked, and, and I probably ultimately would have lost money by going. Going rather than mm. doing all because I was I did about eight school visits uh, this World Book Day week you know all all around that time but you know even so you know this is how things gen you know slowly evolve over time yeah mm. that, that's so interesting because again so many people think the life of a writer is just the writing um whereas even i mean you're talking i mean obviously there's a lot of uh, an unexpected amount of work that goes into a 500 word picture book (laughs) but so much of what you're talking about is the production and the marketing and the outreach and the relationships and all of that type of thing which just um so I, i guess i wanted to ask you on that you've mentioned some figures which and you've said to me before the number of sales that you get as a children's author just doesn't compare to other genres so do you like what are the myths or the mistakes or the things that you think people always get wrong about it well I 
I think most people coming in to write for children probably have no idea how many books they're going to sell. If you know, unless if they know the children's market, they'll know. But I mean, certainly, I'm, and I'm guessing it still holds true. Certainly for picture books, I was told um, very early on that you know you'll be lucky if you sell you know a couple of hundred. You know, if, unless you're Julia Donaldson. Um, so you know, but I've proved that you can sell more than that. I've got. I should have looked at my figures before we spoke, but I actually have got some here. I'm just going to see. This was back in, so Ferdinand Fox's Big Sleep, total print sales, uh, that was 874 um, to the, that was in February of this year. I know it's it'll be not much more at the moment because it's the hedgehog one has taken over, but um, that you know that's nothing compared with what you'll be selling as a as, as an ebook. You're writing for yet YA and adult ebooks. You'll just be selling a lot lot more. Um, so that's the first thing to understand. But equally, that said, you know, the Secret Lake is now selling a heck of a lot. It's selling, you know, I think it's sold this month alone on Amazon. It's sold something like 1,800 copies, you know, which would have been un, you know, unheard of mm. before. But it's because it's been discovered. So it is possible. Um, um I don't know if I've answered your question. Well, so, just any, any more mistakes or, you know, things that new children's authors get wrong or surprises that we might not have covered? I would... That, well, the main thing, as I say, is just knowing that your main, the main way you're going to sell is by going out uh, and doing those events. And it's hard. It's hard. But what we, it's, it's because schools are busy, you know, they're busy places, so you've just got to find your way in and be patient. Um, and the other things I've done, um, which is not just school events, there will be local events, which you might think in first sight aren't worth doing. So to give an example, last year, uh, no, it would have been 2016, it was the 50th anniversary of the World Cup. Uh, us, 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 you know, winning the world, England winning the World Cup, and they had a family day down the road here at the local sports centre, and I took a table there because Eek is about an alien who runs away from space to Earth because he's mad about football and the World Cups on. So I thought, well, I'll go down there and get a table, and it cost me fifteen pounds for that table. And I was there for nine o'clock till about half past five. Bob popped down a couple of times. I think I sold thirty books. So um, it was fifteen pounds for the table. So I made about fifteen pounds. <laughs> So we were joking about my hourly rate, you know. <laughs> but having said that, one of the little girls who bought my book went back to her school, who then contacted me and said, "So and so's bought the Secret Lake. She really loved it, and she would. Would you like? To, would you could, could you come and do World Book Day for us?" So I ended up doing World Book Day for them, which was a paid, you know, a paid event and selling to the whole school. Uh, and on top of that, uh, I had this Barry Davis, very quite famous World Cup commentator from 1966 I got a picture of him holding Eek because he was commentating for this uh, for this event and I've got a picture of him with Eek which I used at the time and now with the World Cup having just come around I've sent a couple of tweets out with pictures of oh here's here's my fan Barry Davis back again you know <laughs> <laughs> so so it, you know there are things you do where you don't make a lot of money but later on you know they're all part of that mix but mm. I, I would say it's definitely with children's books it's 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 definitely not a race to market it's passion and um being patient with it and, and don't give up the day job if you see what i mean Get yeah and have a long-term that. view basically absolutely long-term view long-term view mm. absolutely no, that's fantastic and i mean uh, final question you're very well connected you go to all these events you live in london i, I you're also very professional and you know because you've worked in finance you know all the figures you you are you know when you talk to publishers and things you give a very good um representation i think of yourself and also indie writers so i wondered like with all your connections that you have and the fact that you decided not to go back to traditional do you see the attitude changing towards indie children's writers and illustrators or do you think it's kind of getting even worse because the biggest children's authors are all you know famous like david walliams for example the answer is in some ways 
I don't really know because I'm not pursuing. I'm not pursuing a traditional. Uh, I'm not pursuing a traditional publishing. So I don't sort of come into contact with them hugely. I mean, what I would say is that the wider attitudes are definitely much better than they were. So, for example, I ran a session at the Barnes Children's Literature Festival this year. I had a packed tent. Uh, there were probably about 50 people there, and and the subject was how to self-publish and market a children's book. It was a it was a, a session. You know, a paid session, mm-hmm. uh, and it was a session out now when i first did that uh, festival a few years ago you know the idea that someone might be talking about children's self-publishing would have been you know um you know, especially, in bonds. <laughs> absolutely, especially in bonds absolutely especially in bonds but actually to be fair to them you know they that first year when it first started and it's now become the biggest uh, children's festival in the uk they did i was a local author and they welcomed me and i had a session there i mean it wasn't paid but that was fine um and i've been there every year since so so the, the to that extent yes um and i think always my experience has been that schools are agnostic about whether you're self-published or not and some actively support self-published um children's books uh authors rather i spoke to there's a school in kingston called um holy cross that i went to a few years ago and i I rang them just before the summer holidays just to say you know i thought you might be interested to know that the secret lake is now you know seems to have taken off because they were so supportive of me and you know she was delighted to hear and she said oh yes we've got another self-published author coming in we you know we like to support them so so schools have always been very supportive i think the local media have and up to a point i think probably the national media it is just things like there is a um, things like the National, uh, I want to say the Literacy Trust, I'm trying to remember their exact name. Um, they are a charity that um, helps, you know, encourage reading uh, for, you know, all, all children. I've had problems getting my, you know, now you know, my books are quite established and have been for quite a long time. And I've contacted them previously to say, would you consider including Eek in your reluctant readers' recommendations? And I've sort of come up against a brick wall. And I, you know, I think there's still a bit of that in, in yes, in the working area of traditional publishing. But then you get fantastic people like um, Sam Missingham, who is, you know, she's she's from the traditional world and she's now started up these lounge books, isn't it? Where where she's 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 agnostic as to who's there. You know, it is changing, but it, it's it's a slow and it's a slow slow release. On, on that side, on the traditional publisher's side, but I think eventually it's all going to just merge into one. And you know, mm. it was quite interesting, as you probably saw at um, Thriller Fest this year, that Mark Dawson or James rather have been interviewing, you know, all these traditionally published Lee Child and all that lot. I mean, I just think there's this whole thing of everything colliding together, mm. and it's going to from the bottom up, we're all going to come together and just probably, you know not blow it out of the water i don't want to make it sound negative but i think slowly you know we know that the freelancers are all on reedsy now and they're from traditional publishing houses it's all going to melt together i think yeah <laughs> yeah well, i think that's a good Actually, way of putting... i might be up being optimistic but uh, it certainly has moved on because just last point on that when i did go and give a talk at penguin well, at their hat it was a it was called the children's book circle i think it was back in 2013 they were asking about self-publishing and at the time i said to them you know i think there's going to be a lot of freelance work for editors coming your way and that was before you know that was just at that moment where it was all starting to change and i just suddenly thought yes all these people in the traditional world they're going to start jumping on the back on the bandwagon in a good way you know mm. Um, so I just like to see a little bit more with the maybe some in the, the book selling press, as it were. I suppose mm. um, Dawn Books very receptive when I spoke to them recently. You know, so yeah, things know. are definitely changing. Fantastic. So we are out of time. So where can people find you and your books online? Okay, so they can find my children's books. Um, uh, I've got my website is KarenInglisAuthor.com, and of course I have a Karen English page on Amazon, so they can go there to see print and ebooks. They can read about. Can I hold my card up for yeah. my my new book? So my this will be out as an ebook at the end of this month, but actually the print book won't be out until September because it's so much work and so much was changing at the last minute. Not least things like ConvertKit suddenly deciding to rebrand itself. <laughs> 
Oh yes, that's Amazon, fun. Yes, Amazon deciding, you know, there's all this funny stuff to do with reviews, and that there was enough important things changing that I thought, oh, I don't want to go and publish this in a hurry, not to include those things. So I had hope for a June publication, but ebook now um, uh, going out. Fingers crossed, 31st of July, it'll be available. But I imagine it would be much better as a print book. I, I would personally <laughs> want the print book, but there we go. But it will be a great of... ebook as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm so useless at marketing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so hopefully by the time this goes out, which I think might be in September, the print book will either be out or nearly out, and it will have the, the page going up. And it will be under the name Karen P. English, P for Patricia uh, English, because I don't want the self-publishing book to sit there as this sort of tomb sitting there in front of all my children's books when people go to my Amazon page. Yes, uh, they're actually, also bought. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I've, Rach, Rachel Ralston has just sent me, actually, she's just put a P in my name, so I can at least create the ebook page for now, and um, the print book will be available. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Karen. That was great. All right. Well, thank you, Joanna.